as we get started, welcome back as we had our little break from our first six-week session. We'll now uh, begin our, our second uh, session. When we ended, um, we were in Acts chapter 5. And uh, if you just look at your Bibles real quick, you see where chapter 5 uh, begins with the story of Ananias and his wife, uh, Sapphira. And if you remember that story, they sold all the Christians in the early church. They were selling their homes and their land, and they were just giving it to the church. They didn't want that because their focus was the church. They weren't being asked to do it, but it just came natural that they wanted to do that. Well, if you remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira, they sold and gave their money to the church, but they hid a little back and didn't tell anyone. And they have to be both struck down. And in essence, the moral of the story being the lesson is, do we give ourselves completely to living our faith? <coughs> or do we try to maintain control? God, I'm going to give you most of my life, but I'm still going to control this part. Well, I start there because on our pilgrimage in Rome, we on Sunday attended Mass. We arrived on Saturday. And so on Saturday evening, we had Mass on the rooftop of our hotel. And the backdrop was St. Peter's Dome, all lit up at night. And it was a beautiful evening. We had Mass there and then some nice wine up on the roof um, after dinner. But um, the next day, Sunday morning, we went to the Italian Mass in St. Peter's Basilica, um, which is behind the high altar in the far part of the transept. So St. Peter's, most churches are built in a cross. Uh, so we are at this end of the cross. So come in the front doors of St. Peter's and then walk two blocks, two football fields to the other end. Okay? And we had mass back there. Uh, in Italian, but they do one of the readings in English, and our lecture that day was Russ Schmidt. So uh, Russ read at St. Peter's on Sunday morning uh, when we were over there. And then um, the next day, we were back at St. Peter's, but I celebrated <laughs> Mass with our group um, at a special altar. We celebrate Mass at the altar of the tomb of St. John Paul II. And so when uh, John Paul II died, he was buried in St. Peter's Basilica in the crypt, so in the basement. And then when he was canonized the saint, he was brought up into the main church and he was placed in what was known or is called St. Bar Bartholomew's Chapel. And uh, so he is now buried there. But as priests, we go to the sacristy of St. Peter's Basilica and there are lots of priests going in there and they have servers that arrive early in the morning and all masses start at 7.15 a.m. And so you have to be there in advance, and you get vested in the sacristy, and they have servers for every priest, because there are literally dozens upon dozens upon dozens of altars. So lots of masses are going on all at the same time, all in different languages, depending on where the priests were from. So our group was at the tomb of St. John Paul II. Um, obviously our mass was in English. But when you come out of the sacristy as a priest and a server, there is a painting. So you literally walk out of the sacristy and straight ahead on the wall is this incredible painting, which I'll pass it around. It's this painting right here, which is literally the depiction of the death of Ananias and Sapphira. That when you go to celebrate mass, you should be celebrating it all as a priest, as a server, any of us attending Mass, we should be holding nothing back. It gives you a whole new understanding. Am I paying attention? What am I thinking about during Mass? Am I trying to grow my faith or am I worrying about what I have to do when I get home? This is literally the painting that you walk out of the sacristy to go celebrate Mass. You're reminded. Are you giving it your all? So I pass that around. It's a beautiful painting. 
but uh, I just thought it was a good tie-in because uh, it's where we left off when we ended um, our Bible study, uh, the first session. Now, um, interestingly, where we pick up now today in chapter 6 and chapter 7, um, the church is continuing to grow. And so we're going to hear about that right away, that this early church is booming. Disciples keep coming on board. People are becoming Christian. Um, but as we see, and as we remember, if you uh, recall in the first session, immediately after Pentecost, and the apostles were preaching and teaching the first miracle of the beggar, at the beautiful gate, it started getting messy right away. Just as Jesus was starting to get chastised because he was healing and teaching and preaching, now suddenly we see that mirrored in the life of the early church. The apostles are being persecuted. If you remember, they were arrested. The angel got them out. And also where we left off, it was Gamaliel, one of the elders, the Sanhedrin, that the people respected, said, watch out what you're doing. You could be waging war against God, and you're not going to win. If it is of human origin, it will fail. If it is of <laughs> God, you're going to be waging war against God. Well... We see in the early church that living as a disciple, following Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. As our speaker last night said, Jesus didn't say, hey, let me show you a way. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Our speaker last night also said at the end, it gets messy. Today's gospel echoed that. Jesus himself says, you are going to be persecuted. You could be thrown in prison. You could be thrown in prison by your own father or mother, brothers or sisters. And then he ends, and you could even die. So here's the early church, the same church we are part of today. It's not easy to live out our Catholic faith through Jesus. It's countercultural goes against, especially in this time of understanding that we're in a battle, is contrary to what the world would think. So as chapter 6 begins, my Bible has a little title that says, The Need for Assistance. And as we begin reading, at that time, as the number of disciples continued to grow, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So the twelve, meaning the apostles, called together the community of the disciples and said, it is not right for us, the apostles, to neglect the word of God to serve at the table. So the apostles were saying, we need help, but we need to stick with preaching and teaching and healing. But we need assistance at serving. And what was being brought up was serving the widows. Now why? What's the whole thing with the Hellenists and the Hebrews? Well, remember in the commission, Jesus said, go to the ends of the earth. But at the beginning of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, 
where we hear that line, Jesus tells the apostles, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit to become my witnesses, martyrs, to die to yourself daily. That's what it is to be a witness. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll become my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Remember that line, that verse in chapter 1 when we first started the study? The Hellenists are Greek Jews that are becoming Christians. The Hebrews are the Jews that were there in Jerusalem. So if we're now having Greek Jews becoming Christians, that means we're moving from just the city of Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. So just that word, Hellenists, we know that the Hellenists are Greek, but they were uh, the Greek-speaking Jews. They were following the Septuagint, whereas the Hebrews were native to Palestine, native to Jerusalem. And so there's a tension between these two groups that are now both becoming Christian because Christianity is growing. Now, why attention, though, to you're not paying attention to our widows? Widows are females. Widows means their husband has died. Who is God? God is the husband, the father. And so widows have lost their husband. A husband cares for his wife. A father cares for his children. So when they're saying our widows are not being paid attention to physically, literally, the widows, but why that is so important is because that whole understanding of God as father, God as husband, we call the church, the bride of Christ. Christ is the groom. Again, it's that idea of husband. And a husband and a father cares for his wife and his children. And so the apostles are taking note. Because they do recognize that that's really important to take care of the widows and the orphans. In fact, in the Old Testament, there are several references of taking care of widows and orphans. That's all coming out of that mindset that God is a husband, a father. So, we see the church growing. And as the church grows, we see that it, most importantly, wants to take care of the needs of the church. And the most important needs they do see being caring for the widows and the orphans. I want to draw your attention to your workbooks. If you go to page 41, the bottom of page 41, there's a, a chart, a graph. So, we have the two big focus groups that the church focuses on. The church's mission to the Jews, so I'm looking on the far left side, and the church's mission to the Gentiles, everyone else who's not Jewish. But then that next column, you have where in Acts we're falling. So, Acts 1 through 8... Obviously, we're focusing on the church's mission to the Jews, but 1 through 8, but then 8 through 12, if you next to the middle column, it's the witness in Jerusalem, but the church is growing, so there's that witness to Judea and Samaria. And then down below, Acts 13 to the end, 
28, it's witness to the ends of the earth. So that Acts chapter 1, verse 8, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That is now literally being lived out. And so we see that. I just want to draw your attention to that breakdown. So then uh, the next column over, the top, in cha uh, chapters 1 through 8 of Acts, where the witnesses in Jerusalem, the city, the center is Jerusalem, and the main apostle is Peter. Acts 8 through 12, which we're still in, we're moving out, though, to Judea and Samaria. The center is still Jerusalem, and the main apostle is Peter. But then when we go to the ends of the earth, notice that the center of that becomes Antioch, which is now up in present-day Turkey. And the main apostle is now going to become Paul. And Paul gets introduced tonight at the end of chapter 7, as we will see. Not as Paul, but as Saul. And then look at that last column. In chapters 1 through 8, we're dealing with about a two-year time frame. In chapters 8 through 12, we're dealing with about a 10-year time frame. And then 13 through 28 represent about a 17-year time frame. So just to give you a perspective as we're going through this, but we're literally seeing what was spoken in chapter 1, verse 8. We're now seeing that lived out. Um, and so as it's being lived out, we see here at the very beginning, the number of disciples continued to grow. And so that brought with it then needs, and in particular needs to the widows and the orphans. But again, the apostles are making a distinction between themselves and this next group. And the word that pulls this part, we shall appoint, so chapter, or verse 3, brothers, select from among you seven reputable men, filled with the Spirit. So select from among all of you seven. We want you to select seven reputable men whom we shall appoint to this task. So the word task connects back, doesn't sound like the word in English, but the word task connects back up here um, where the apostle says, it is not right for us to neglect the word of God to serve. So the task is service. It's not that proclaiming the gospel, the good news, isn't a service, but they're talking specifically about the service to the widows and the orphans. And that's where we get the word in Greek, diakonia, deacon. Deacon literally means to serve, a servant. So our deacons here were ordained to serve just like the very first deacons. And so, they choose seven. The proposal was acceptable to the whole community. So they chose Stephen, a man filled with faith in the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, a convert to Judaism. So they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. The word of God continued to spread, and the number of the disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly. Even a large group of priests were becoming obedient to the faith. That's an interesting line. 
Because guess who the priests are? The Sanhedrin. So the same group that had gone after the apostles, many of them are now becoming Christians. So, the church is growing. We now are adding deacons to help serve this growing church. And in a very particular way, adding deacons to serve the widows and the orphans. They are seen as most important in the service of the church because of that whole understanding of God as father, as husband. So yes, they are widows, their husband on earth died, but God, the eternal father, the eternal husband, cares for them. So, tension begins. We see tension as soon as the widows aren't being cared for. But the apostles right away want to heal and fix because they know there should be no tension. And they do that by the introduction of the deacons. Um, if you go to, uh, just to give you an idea, go to the book of James, chapter 1. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we're just going to start at verse 19, chapter 1, verse 19. Know this, my dear brothers, everyone should be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of a man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filth and evil excess and humbly welcome the word that has been planted in you and is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deluding yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his own face in a mirror. He sees himself and then goes off and promptly forgets what he looked at. But the one who peers into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres and is not a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, such a one shall be blessed in what he does. Now listen to this next part, starting in verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, his religion is vain. Verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this to care for orphans and widows in their affliction and keep oneself unstained <coughs> by the world. It brings a whole new light to how we treat individuals in nursing homes, or those who are at home by themselves. Mother Teresa said the greatest poverty in the world today is loneliness. Here we have the book of James just echoing what we're hearing in the Acts. Pure religion cares for the orphans and the widows.
So we've been introduced now to Stephen. And you probably all have heard that Stephen was the first martyr of the church. Actually not correct. Because the first martyrs of the church we celebrate on December 26th every year, the day after Christmas. It's the Feast of the Holy Innocents. Is it 26th or 28th? It's right after Christmas. But anyway, the Feast of the Holy Innocents, where Herod knows about Jesus, so he just orders all the babies killed. So the Holy Innocents are actually seen as the first martyrs of Christianity. They lost their life because of Jesus. Um, but tradition holds giving Stephen this title of the first martyr of the church. Um, but just to give you a little uh, footing if you want to argue with someone someday. So <clears throat> notice when they chose Stephen, so back um, verse 5, the proposal was acceptable to the whole community. So they chose Stephen. A man filled with faith and the Holy Spirit. Now, jump back to verse 8. Now, Stephen, filled with grace and power, was working great wonders and signs among the people. Certain members of the so-called Synagogue of Freedom, freedmen, Cyrenians and Alexandrians and people from Cilicia and Asia came forward and debated with Stephen. <laughs> but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they instigated some men. We have heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, accosted him, seized him, and brought him before the Sanhedrin. Remember how New Testament mirrors Old Testament? Early church mirrors Jesus? Stephen, filled with grace and power, was working great wonders and signs among the people. Jesus, Stephen. They instigated some men to say, we have heard him speaking blasphemous and words against Moses and God. Fake news. Going after Jesus. Fake news going after Stephen. They brought him before the Sanhedrin. Jesus, before Pontius Pilate, before the Sanhedrin, now Stephen. So just as the same things were happening to Jesus, we see that just echoed, mirrored, in now the life of Stephen. They presented false witnesses who testified. The man never stopped saying things against this holy place. What's the holy place? The temple in Jerusalem. But remember at the beginning of Acts of the Apostles and remember Jesus. Remember what Jesus said? Destroy this temple and I will raise it. I will rebuild it in three days. So we understand and the early Christians understand that the focus point is not the temple, the building in Jerusalem. Jesus is the new temple. But they're now going after Stephen for saying blasphemous things about this holy place because he's trying to teach them Jesus is the new temple. So as we're going to see, just as in the Old Testament, the Israelites kept putting idols in front of themselves, golden calf, the Tower of Babel, even earlier. 
the Jews were still putting idols in front of themselves. The temple was becoming an idol. And Stephen is preaching against this. All those, verse 15, or let's back up, 14. For we have heard him claim that this Jesus, the Nazarene, will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. All those that sat in Sanhedrin looked intently at him and saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now we'll return to that, because that was one of your questions. Well, why would it look, why would Stephen look like the face of an angel? The answer is in chapter 7. So we begin chapter 7, which is Stephen's discourse. Rod just asked, don't all deacons look like the face of an angel? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> but chapter 7 is Stephen's response. Now, verses 1 through 53 are his response. So almost the whole chapter. And I'm not going to read it verbatim, but I'm going to go through this because this is awesome what Stephen does. Because in essence, Stephen paints a picture for all these guys who are throwing fake news out about him to try and get him out of their lives because they're having their idols. They don't want to change their ways. Because becoming Christian requires effort. It's messy. It's not always easy. But this picture that Stephen paints is the Bible timeline Bible study that Ascension Press did with Jeff Cavins. If any of you have ever done that, it's a 24-week Bible study that goes from Genesis to Revelation and breaks down the whole Bible to show the story of mm -hmm. salvation history. Now I say the story of salvation history, but it's, it's our story. In the beginning, creation. So I just want you to visualize on my fake whiteboard up here. Okay? We have creation. Oh, the earth is round, so there you go, right there. So, we have creation. Adam and Eve. The next big event after creation, especially creation of man, made in God's image and likeness, is the fall. Distortion entered the world. But God doesn't give up. We have, you know, Cain and Abel, and Abel being killed, and then we have Seth, and Seth actually leads, ultimately, in his line, to Noah. So with Adam and Eve, you have one holy <coughs> couple. With Noah being spared in the flood, it was Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives, and the animals, two by two, in pairs, and it even says male and female. We have with Noah one holy family. They're spared from the flood, which was God saying, I am so just... Why did I create man? Why did I create all of this? Look at this sinfulness. I'm just going to wipe it all out. But he found favor with one. found favor with Noah. And so there was a new covenant. The first covenant of Adam and Eve was broken by the fall. Now we have a new covenant. The sign being <coughs> the rainbow. And man is spared. So then you follow that story and that line, we get to Abraham. So we have one holy couple, Adam and Eve, one holy family, 
Noah and his family. Now with Abraham, we have one holy tribe. <coughs> and notice, in the story of salvation, I said that Stephen sets it out. He tells, in verses 1 through 51, the story of salvation, that's where he starts. My brothers and fathers, verse 2, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was in Mesopotamia. Now, interestingly, I'm going to point out just in these first couple verses, Stephen says, in Mesopotamia, before he settled in Haran, and said to him, go forth from your land and from your kinsfolk to the land that I will show you. So he went forth from the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. Remember how the early church is getting rid of their property? Disciples are becoming Christian and they're selling their land and just giving it to the church. You have the Jews that are mad at Stephen because they're holding on to their idol, the temple. But Stephen is going all the way back to Abraham saying, land means nothing. Buildings mean nothing. So even this discourse and how he's just leaving his land, it's like now this early church, land and property doesn't mean anything. Now it meant something to the time of Abraham because that was what was promised to them. Abraham's on this mountain and God speaks to him, Abram, I'm going to give you a land filled with milk and honey, a promised land. I want you to go and tell your kinsfolk, pack up. I'll tell you where you're going when you're on the way. And here is going to be the sign of the covenant. Here's your knife. Now you're sitting there thinking, here's your knife. The sign of the covenant was circumcision. Think about that for a second, guys. Here's Abraham that's going to go back to his holy tribe. And he's first going to tell Sarah, Sarah, God just spoke to me. He's giving us a promised land, a land of milk and honey. We got to pack up. We got to go. And Sarah's like, awesome, where is this place? Abraham goes, I don't know, he's going to tell us on the way. <laughs> How many wives are going to follow their husbands? <laughs> Thank God, this was a patriarchal society. So they trusted. Just as they trusted God, they trusted, Sarah trusted her husband. So they packed up. But before they could pack up, Abram had to tell the rest, including the guys, hey, guys, come here, quick. God is giving us a new land, a promised land, a hand of milk and honey. It's going to be ours. Really? Dude, cool. Where is it? Uh, he's going to show us on the way. Uh, okay. I guess. God told you. And by the way, here's the sign. You have to circumcise yourself. And they're like, huh? <laughs> Why? Going back to Christianity is messy. It hurts at times. That was going to be painful. It is not always easy to follow God. It is not always going to be easy to trust in God. So you have Stephen going back and telling the Sanhedrin, who are Jewish, this is their father in faith, going back to them to start talking about salvation history. He's like, uh, guys, remember? But he keeps going. So we go down a little bit. Verse 7. 
um, or let's go eight. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so he became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day, as Isaac did Jacob, and Jacob, the twelve patriarchs. So Jacob, his name gets changed. Jacob becomes, his name becomes Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. But now remember the story of Jacob? Stephen's not talking about it. It's one of my favorite stories. Why is it my favorite story? Because you got people thinking, my life is so bad. My life, you just can't imagine how bad my life is, how fun dysfunctional my family is. Dysfunctional? Read the Old Testament. The story of Jacob? Jacob lies and steals his brother Esau's privilege, inheritance, life. So Jacob goes. He knows he's got to go away. He goes away. He meets this girl, Rachel. <laughs> Rachel's the daughter of Laban. And Jacob is head over heels. And so Jacob goes to Laban. Your daughter is so beautiful. I love her. May I have her hand in marriage? And Laban goes, sure. Now, I can't help but think this story. This is Rod Weevilhaus. Okay. Rod Weevilhaus is Laban. Because Laban looks at Jacob, sure, you can have my daughter. Be my slave for seven years. <laughs> so, so, I'm just joking. He always acts so tough to his son-in-laws. But, <laughs> so, Jacob's in love. He's like, okay, absolutely. Seven years pass. He goes back to Laban. Laban, remember the deal? Seven years are up. Laban goes, you got it. Go up to the house, up on the hill. Consummate your marriage. Have my daughter. Well, it's dark out. Jacob's like, oh yeah. <laughs> he gets up to the house. He's like, boom, under the covers. Wakes up the next morning. Ah! It's Rachel's sister. <clears throat> <clears throat> He's married to Leah, the wrong girl. He goes back to Laban. He goes, Laban, what did you do? And he goes, uh, I told you you could have my daughter. Uh, first one goes first. Oldest goes first. But I wanted to marry Rachel. I tell you what, you be my slave for another seven years, I'll give you Rachel. So he sticks around another seven years. He gets married to Rachel. Rachel can't have children. So she says, sort of like in the Sarai, said to Abram, Rachel says, have my maidservant, have children through her. Well, that upsets Leah. And Leah, the first wife, says, uh-uh, you can have my maidservant. We have 12 children. One dad, four moms, 12 kids. The 12 boys hate the youngest son, Joseph, so they throw him in a well and he's sold into slavery. Dysfunctional. <laughs> but we have Stephen, not going into that detail, but he's saying, as Isaac did Jacob and Jacob, the 12 patriarchs, I mean the 12 tribes, or remember, Joseph gets sold into slavery, but Joseph becomes befriended by who? The Pharaoh. And who ends up coming before Joseph in the famine? His brother. And they don't recognize him. But Joseph recognizes them. <laughs> so just by saying these names, Stephen is literally trying to wake up the Sanhedrin. Because they're not paying attention to what's all transpired in the past of their own history, their own story. Then he continues on. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him to slavery in Egypt. 
but God was with him, rescued him from all his afflictions, granted him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who put him in charge of Egypt and of his entire household. Then the famine. So, talk about that. Jump down. Verse 17. When the time drew near for the fulfillment of the promise that God pledged to Abraham, the people had increased and become very numerous in Egypt until another king who knew nothing of Joseph came into power. He dwelt shrewdly with our people and oppressed our ancestors by forcing them to expose their infants that they might not survive. At this time, Moses was born. So he starts with Abraham. He's going through salvation history. He's now bringing up Moses was born. And Moses was spared. Eventually, after three months being raised by the Pharaoh's daughter. But then in verse 23, Moses is 40 years old. And he knows his kinsfolk. He knows he's not Egyptian. He knows he's, a, he's an Israelite. Mm -hmm. And so he goes to see his brothers and sisters, the Israelites, his kinfolk. And as he goes to see them, here is one of the Pharaoh's guards beating an Israelite. <clears throat> that infuriates Moses. So what's he do? Kills the guy. Quickly buries him. But people saw him do it. So he knows he has to go away. So he goes in hiding in the desert. So he's 40 years old when he kills the guy, buries him, goes into hiding. Now, jump to verse 30. 40 years later, an angel appeared to Moses, to him in the desert near Mount Sinai, in the flame of a burning bush. So Moses is now 80 years old when he encounters the burning bush. And the voice of the Lord came, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Then Moses, trembling, did not dare to look at it. But the Lord said to him, Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have witnessed the affliction of my people in Egypt, and have heard their groaning, and I have come down to rescue them. Come now, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they had rejected with the words, who appointed you ruler and judge, God sent as both ruler and deliverer. He rescues them. We're familiar with these stories. He goes to the Pharaoh and says, release these people. Pharaoh goes, forget it. So now we have the ten plagues. The last being the Passover. The Exodus. Of which the Pharaoh's son died. So now we have them departing. We have the splitting of the sea, the Red Sea. Them escaping. And now they're out in the desert, and we know they're out there for 40 years. Now we're moving Moses to 120 years old. But this is all part of our history. The history of Stephen, the history of the Sanhedrin, the guys that are throwing around fake news to get rid of Stephen, and they're not getting it. But Stephen continues... So he talks about their escape, but then saying to Aaron, make us gods. They pushed Moses aside. And so then Stephen talks about how our ancestors, <coughs> they wanted idols just like you. <coughs> they got the golden calf. And then Stephen starts quoting from Hebrew scriptures, the book of Amos. This is Amos chapter 5, verse 25 through 27. So if in your Bible you have it sort of, you see a different size print and it's set apart. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings for 40 years in the desert, O house of Israel? No, you took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your God, Rephon, and the images that you made to worship. So I shall take you into exile beyond Babylon. 
<coughs> if you remember, there's 400 years of slavery in Egypt. But then Moses <coughs> lets them out. They're 40 years in the desert, but they get to the promised land. But if you remember, in the story of salvation history, there's a long period of the Babylonian exile. This happens after they've already had 400 years of slavery in Egypt. But Stephen is reminding them, they're making things, they're idols. You're making the temple your idol and not seeing that Jesus Christ is God, the Son of God, who conquered sin and death, who has opened the gates of heaven for you. So Stephen, in going through this whole timeline, if you will, <clears throat> is trying to get them to see what's going on, that they're missing the boat. Verse 44, our ancestors had the tent of testimony in the desert, just as the one who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern he had seen. Our ancestors who inherited it brought it with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out from before our ancestors up to the time of David. So he's just continuing along the timeline. Now he's bringing up David. And then he brings up verse 47. But Solomon built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, the heavens are my throne. The earth is my footstool. What kind of house can you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is to be my resting place? Did not my hand make all these things? We're back to creation. And now is where Stephen essentially tacks the nail into his coffin. Starting verse 51. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always oppose the Holy Spirit. You are just like your ancestors. What does it mean, stiff-necked? If you're stiff-necked, you're not looking back. They're not looking back and seeing, look what has happened. God made us. God made everything. <clears throat> and he made everything holy. Adam and Eve were a holy couple. But they fell. They fell to the serpent's trick of doubt. And with that doubt came shame. And with that shame came fear. <coughs> but God didn't give up. He spared Noah and brought us one holy family. Sparing them from the flood. When all of our ancestors were sinning ridiculously. But that didn't last. So he then calls Abraham, and he's making one holy tribe a chosen people. Us, we were chosen by God. And yet, they fall. They break that covenant. <clears throat> so we have a covenant with Moses, the sign being the Ten Commandments. And that gets broken. Moses being one holy nation, one holy couple, one holy family, one holy tribe, now one holy nation. Four covenants, all four have been broken, but God has never stopped loving you. God has never stopped loving us. In fact, he brought about the fifth covenant, Jesus Christ who, through his death on the cross, conquered sin and death. Just as sin entered the world on a tree, salvation now enters the world on a tree. Old Adam, new Adam. 
And Stephen is telling the people who are persecuting him, who have had him arrested, and who will not listen to him, he says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised and hardened ears. Meaning they're not listening. You are not paying attention to everything that's gone on in our history. <coughs> well, that ticks them off. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They put to death those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You received the law as transmitted by angels, but you did not observe it. Well, guess what? Verse 44. When they heard this, they were infuriated. And they ground their teeth at him. I just want you to... Uh, I love these next few verses. Verse 55. But he, meaning Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked up intently to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said... Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Why did Stephen have the face of an angel? Because he had encountered the beatific vision. The beatific vision, what we will encounter when we come face to face with God. When we reach heaven and we encounter the glory of God, that's the beatific vision. Stephen was encountering that. <clears throat> he has the face of an angel because we're our angels in heaven. Angels have encountered the beatific vision. Stephen is not an angel. Humans and angels are different creation. But to say he has the face of an angel is because he has encountered the glory of God. He has encountered the beatific vision. But now remember, up here at the beginning, verse 51, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised and hard ears, you always oppose the Holy Spirit. You're not listening, he says. Uncircumcised ears, you're not listening. <clears throat> you can't help but laugh at verse 57. But they cried out in a loud voice, covered their ears, and rushed upon him together. Can't you just see these idiots? La, 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 I'm not listening, I'm not hearing you. <coughs> Meanwhile, Stephen, who's got the beatific vision, is like, oh, if you only knew. If you only knew the boat you're missing. They threw him out of the city and began to stone him. The witnesses laid down their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. <coughs> Welcome the next new character. Now remember, in the first session, I said many, many people were becoming Christians. As we heard at the beginning of tonight, the disciples were growing. But if you remember, I said a lot of people were becoming Christians seeing the martyrdom. And I said, well, why? What would be attractive to becoming Christian if you see they're being killed? <clears throat> because when they're being killed, they were nonstop producing fruits of the Holy Spirit. The people were attracted not to the martyrdom, they were attracted to the fruits that were just coming off of these people's lives. So here is Saul standing at the martyrdom of Stephen, who has seen the glory of God. He's encountered the beatific vision. This is going to lead into Saul's conversion. <clears throat> Saul was not stoning him, but
but he had been persecuting the Christians, and now suddenly he witnesses Stephen's martyrdom. And it's going to lead us to his conversion. Saul just encountered the fruits of the Holy Spirit. The fruits of the Holy Spirit that were coming off the life of St. Stephen. As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell to his knees and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. <clears throat> Sound familiar to something else? <coughs> Jesus on the cross. We have that mirroring again, going back and forth. So that brings us to the end of chapter 7. And I did not look at any of my notes. I was going from memory, see if I missed anything. So how old is Saul at this time? Is he a young man? Yeah, middle-aged. Probably somewhere in his 30s, 40s. Um, I do want to point out one thing. When in that conclusion, verse 52, St. Stephen says, Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? He's going right at the heart of these guys that are going after him. And by saying that line, he's really saying, this is in your pedigree. This is in your DNA. Just like it was in the pedigree of your ancestors. You don't get it. It is messy being Christian. It is not easy living the life of the Christian faith. But we see that it brings about the glory of God. Amen. Um, next week, we'll be on session 8, which begins on page 47. Um, and we will be uh, just focused on one chapter next week, Acts chapter 8. Um <clears throat> Because of our speaker last night, we flip-flopped the restart. Um, so next week, we'll be back at our normal, what we did the first session. So next week, Tuesday evening, which would be December 5th, 7 p.m. here at the Parish Center. Very good. God bless you. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless each of you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Um, one little sidebar. Um, so YouTube doesn't like my videos on that, so I had to download a new actual YouTube app. And so to do the videos from the first session, I actually have to burn them onto CDs or DVDs. Um, so raise your hand if you want a set of the first <coughs> session. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, eight. Very good. I'll make ten. Thank you very much. God bless you.